All right, so today I have to go to an epilepsy convention. It's me and Marlon. You know, it's so we were gonna bring the kids, but they would have been, you know, bad as hell. So I've never been to one of these things. It's gonna be pretty interesting. I guess they're having doctors from USC, you know, like psychological doctors, everybody. They're gonna be talking about all our meds. They're gonna have groups, they're gonna have um, everything just so we can talk about all types of stuff. And um, I'm actually pretty excited. I'm really nervous because I've never been to something like this. Um, uh, it's gonna be pretty interesting. It's a four hour convention and it's an epilepsy thing and I'm excited but nervous at the same time. I have all my pills with me. We're gonna be taking notes. They supply us with lunch, everything like that. And we'll be recording inside there. We'll be doing everything like that just to have if the whole. They let us. Yeah, hopefully they let us. To have the whole epilepsy thing going on. And I'll be updating on how it went at the end because I'm really excited about this, but. Yeah, I want to learn more about this and how I want to expand my knowledge on this. So, yeah. All right, then. Pretty much any of these medications that we use to treat epilepsy have potential for um, creating or having an association with birth defects. The number one thing that I tell young women, two main, main things I tell young women when they're of childbearing age, whether they're ready to have a baby or not, is when you take a seizure medicine, it's really important to take folic acid supplementation as well. Because if you go into a pregnancy low on folic acid, then your risk is much higher of having birth defects. The second thing is choosing the right medication and staying on it. Because it is more harmful to actually have really bad seizures during pregnancy than it is to have a, an exposure to a medicine, have a baby exposed to a medicine during pregnancy. So we try to choose certain medications. Unfortunately, now, these days, we have a pretty good idea of which medicines are a little bit safer than others. Um, it used to be that we sort of lumped all of those anti-seizure medications together in one bucket and said, oh gosh, there are bad outcomes when people get pregnant. And I've even had patients who have been told by a doctor that they should never get pregnant because they're on a seizure medicine, and that is wrong. Mm. We do know that there are medicines that are safer to take, and then we do know that there are medicines that are less safe in pregnancy. And that is due to a, a national study that was published um, in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago looking at specific medicines and those studies are continuing with many, many more medications than come on market. So supporting somebody in terms of taking folic acid and 
staying compliant with medications and talking to your doctor about what is the best and safest medicine is the most important message. Great. Thank you for that. So uh, next question, we have a lot of questions. So some of them relate to topics that will be covered by the other speakers, so I'll also sort of moderate that. Um, this one's one area I think you should take. How do we get to be part of the epilepsy clinic in Bakersfield? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> 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 so, you know, that, to be absolutely honest with you, like, uh, the, the, even though the, the management is supporting to build up the you know, wonderful epilepsy monitoring unit, the other, uh, you know, the peripherals, like how the, the, uh, the public can participate in, you know, like uh, helping us, uh, like uh, recruiting patients and uh, uh, helping us other activities, not really sort sort out, but like if you guys, because I have like a lot of young guys, very very uh, bashing guys, want to help these communities working with me. So if you guys any ideas, like we just on our personal level, you know, we can uh, work that, and they have to, we can co contact Armin or Sam or Lauren or Elijah. They are all my uh, partners working with me. So they, you know, so we can, but other, in a formal official way, nothing is really formalized. Okay, so what Harry said, right, was that this is a combined effort between all of you and Kern Medical and all of us that are in this epilepsy community. Um, we have to help ourselves. And now that there is a resource at Kern Medical, we really encourage you guys to make inquiries with Kern Medical and help guide us in terms of what we need. Okay? The uh, next question uh, I'd like to uh, ask. Um, uh, Dr. Santos is how do you find the right epilepsy medication? Um, so the, 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 to answer that question I have to go back to what Harry presented. You know you have to have a good idea what kind of seizure that patient is actually having because that dictates the type of medication you're going to use. So obviously, you may have, for example, let's just go to headache. You know, you have a pain, and you may have Tylenol, Advil, Motrin, and so on and so forth. So you may have different choices. So it starts with seizures. It starts with identifying the right seizure. That tells you the, the choices that you have for the right medication. Now, if you have three or four choices, then it comes down to which one is safer. Are they suffering from other conditions other than epilepsy? For example, if they are overweight, you don't want to give them medication that has a side effect of making that worse. Actually, you might want to give them something that makes them lose weight, right? So that's how we go about choosing the, the right medication. Thank you, Dr. Santos. And um, the uh, last question we'll take as part of this, uh, this uh, session, uh, we'll, I'd like to direct to Dr. Holder who is uh, going to speak about uh, genetics, but I think as a preview to her talk, the question is, how often can hereditary epilepsy be, epilepsy be passed on through both men and women? So that's hard to answer in the time you've given me, but we are going to talk about genetics. So it turns out a lot of epilepsy probably has a genetic basis, and depending on what type of gene you carry, that will predict whether it can be passed on from parents to children. Um, it's kind of a teaser because I'm going to talk about that later, um, but it turns out it's actually fairly common to inherit epilepsy through the family. And the wow. good news is once we find the genetic epilepsy that you have, that may actually help us with the previous question and may help us direct treatment. And we can actually find the right treatment based on your genetic diagnosis. So genetics is kind of the new frontier of epilepsy and it's a really exciting topic. So. Great. Thank you, Dr. Holder. So, uh, what I'd like to do now is move on to the next uh, topic, and what we'll do is have the speakers present. We got started a little bit late this morning, but then to save uh, some time for the, for the question and answer, and uh, please make this interactive. If you have, a, if we're saying something that you want to comment on, you raise your hand. Okay. So the next speaker. Oh, fine. Yeah, yeah. Can you explain to the audience? I think it is an important thing. What is the difference between a general neurologist and an epileptologist, and why you guys are so special. 
Debbie, you want to take that? Um, all right, so general neuro so all of us obviously went to medical school and then we completed after medical school medical school training and we all did neurology training first. So for an adult neurologist, which some of us are, they do four years of training to become a general neurologist, which all general all the adult doctors here did. For pediatric neurologists, we actually do five years of training. So we do a little more. I'm not gonna say we're better doctors, but we train a little longer because we take care of kids of all ages. Then after we're done with our neurology training, we all take board exams to be certified as a neurologist. Epileptologists then go on and do additional training, anywhere from one to two years, to specialize in the care of patients with epilepsy. And during that additional one to two years of training, we not only learn how to take care of patients with epilepsy, we also learn how to read the EEG studies. Those are the brainwave tests that many people with epilepsy have had that um, you saw in the first slide, some brainwave pictures. And we also learn how to do some of the advanced care, such as surgery, the implantable devices that you hear about, and in pediatrics, we also use diet therapy. So the advanced care that patients with epilepsy often require to get seizures under control is training that we receive in that one to two years of extra training. And then there's additional board exams that we're eligible to take after that additional training. So most epileptologists only treat patients with epilepsy and have higher level training and additional board exams to provide that special level of care that neurologists don't receive and often aren't skilled to give. So we really, we feel that anybody who has epilepsy and hasn't become seizure free on their first or second medication should see an epileptologist, everybody. And if that means you have to drive somewhere outside where you live, now you guys are lucky because now in Kern County you have access to somebody, yes. um, but if you don't live right in this area or you have to go somewhere outside your area, you really should make that trip at least once if you have epilepsy and aren't seizure free on your first or second medication. There are treatments that we can offer as epileptologists, diagnostic tests we can offer to give you the right diagnosis that general neurologists haven't been trained to do. Okay, well, great. Thank you for that. Um, so I guess we'll uh, move on to the uh, next uh, topic, which is here, and we're coming to ketogenic diet, which is the same, right? This was first used in uh, 1911 by French neurologists who treated 20 adults and children with refractory epilepsy and found that the seizures decreased. In the United States, you Conklin was the first one who used it. He is a uh, an osteopathic physician from Michigan. He believed that epilepsy is a disease from toxins, so he advocated for a uh, uh, strict diet. He, he has a nephew who has a medically refractory epilepsy, and he used starvation, and that kid improved. Uh, but the actual start of where we know ketogenic today started in 1930s, uh, John Hopkins. Uh, there is a rich uh, New York lawyer named Charles Howland. He has a son who has medically refractory epilepsy who actually responded to starvation. So he has a brother who is the uh, full professor of pediatrics at Johns Hopkins, John Howland. He said, I'm going to give you money. I want you to find out why starvation work for my child? And so they did. So the original classic ketogenic diet started at uh, Johns Hopkins, as we know today, because of that funding from that lawyer to his brother. The exact mechanism is unknown, but people think that the uh, anti-epileptic effects start or uh, observation result from ketosis. There are a few. Um, uh, hypothesis that's uh, proposed and uh, through diet you really don't have to starve someone but you can make them ketosis through the diet which is the purpose of the diet right the classic diet contains four parts fat one part carbohydrate plus protein so you calculate the protein too but you have to maintain 90% of your calorie supply from fat you could imagine how difficult this is to do Hard in kids, it's even harder in adults. So, looking at how effective this is, um, there were three, I mean, 11 um, uh, published articles that were uh, reviewed. Nine were retrospective, meaning looking back into a perspective looking forward. Uh, if you look at the use of ketogenic diet, up to 16% of patients could be seizure free. 90% uh, 
seizure reduction could be seen in up to 32 percent, and if 50 uh, percent improvement in about 56 percent patients. So that's, that's the number we normally give when people ask us. So, so what am I looking at? If you start with under that, under that 50 percent improvement, 50 percent cases. So. I mentioned already that this is very hard to do because this is, it doesn't leave you much room, much wiggle room. It's very strict. You have to weigh everything. And you violate one, you drink an extra glass of orange juice and it's gone. It does this mm -hmm. um, But unfortunately, that there are kids who are growing into the adults who are on ketogenic diet that are working well. And we are also finding out that there are diseases that usually starts in kids but may not become symptomatic as an adult who could actually benefit from the diet. And there are genetic diseases now that starts in kids, do well, and only would do well with the ketogenic diet and then grow into an adult, so you need to continue. So there has to be an access. That's the main limiting factor, difficulty in access for an adult ketogenic diet program. So, we have to be creative. That's the classic ketogenic diet. The one I told you, it's a 4 to 1 ratio. Four parts fat, one part carbohydrate and protein combined. So, we have three variations. Medium chain, triglyceride, modified Atkins, and low glycemic index. The modified Atkins is probably the most popular of these three. It's more linear. It allows you to take more protein and about 20 grams of carbohydrate. So it's more palatable, it's easier to maintain. You don't have to admit them to initiate the diet, you don't have to weigh your, your meals. So it's a lot more. So people would ask, so, well, if, if I am not going to do the ketogenic diet, what kind of response will I get if I do the modified Atkins? So here's the thing, uh, to make it simple, if you look at the classic ketogenic diet, equal to or greater than 50% uh, reduction in seizures, they're comparable. This is the modified Atkins. If you look at the equal to or greater than 90% seizure reduction, slightly better for the uh, modified Atkins. But I think to me the most important thing here is adherence, right? We talk about, hey, I'm, I'm going to give you a medication. If you're not going to take it, it's not going to work. So you need to be very, very compliant, right? So, if you look at combined adherence for all types of ketogenic diets, 45%, if you divide them or compare classic versus uh, modified Atkins, you're going to see that more people are staying on the modified Atkins. So, this is one way to do it in adults. Uh, you have more uh, leeway in your uh, carbohydrate, fat, and protein mm -hmm. breakdown. That's and still maintain ketosis and good response. Any questions so far? So, I found this as I was doing this, which to me is very interesting. It has actually been used for uh, status epilepticus. Sorry, I, I missed the reason again. Um, <coughs> are you still think the ketogenic diet is dark agent? No, not really. No, it's not. It's not. They call it that, but it's not. So, um, I didn't see anything in kids, but maybe I just missed them. But that's a pretty good response um, for status epilepticus within three or five days of uh, attaining ketosis, the seizure stopped. Uh, these are super refractory status epilepticus, meaning they continue to have seizures 24 hours after they were placed on an anesthetic or something similar to go into what we call a burst suppression pattern on the EEG. So they're very refractory to medication. These are the most common uh, adverse effects, GI, constipation, diarrhea, occasional mm -hmm. nausea and vomiting, weight loss, nutrition increase in lipids. These things uh, eventually resolve spontaneously and then within a year your lipids normally actually normalize. And if you continue, actually it helps their other comorbid conditions like type 2 diabetes and obesity. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they're losing weight, all you need to do is just adjust the total caloric uh, intake. And that usually takes care of it. So, uh, um, we're talking about herbs. So we're coming full circle now. 
right? We started with herbs, with rule as the most popular, surgery, medication, lung medication, uh, starvation, ketogenic diet, and um, herbs. Um, cannabis originated in Central Asia, but the first detailed description was in 1843, um, when this guy treated a 14-day-old baby girl with recurrent propulsive seizures. It has three main species, cannabis sativa, indica, and rudabravis. Sativa is probably the most uh, popular because it does a, a better CBD or cannabis diol to THC ratio. It contains over 100 biologically active substances called cannabinoids. And the most abundant, most characterized are THC and CBD. What we know of the psychoactive component of uh, 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 cannabidiol or cannab can can cannabis is from THC. Um, CBD is mostly devoid of that psychoactive effect, so the side effect is much, much less compared to THC. If you look at the three pivotal studies that led to the FDA approval of the epidiolex, these are the three studies. Uh, the first one is in children with Grave syndrome, and then the other two are for uh, kids with Lennox disorder. And you could see, no, it's lavender. Yeah, we call it lavender. For much higher than this placebo. So in, in, in summary of, that, of those three studies, it was found that CBD is superior to placebo in reducing convulsive tonic, clonic, tonic, clonic, atonic seizures in patients with Dravet, and it decreased the frequency of drop seizures in patients with lennox gaston syndrome. We've actually seen a lot of patients in our clinic with really, really robust response from uh, uh, CBD. So where do we go from here? We've come full circle already, what's new? There is a, uh, a group of smart people that meet twice a year. And their last year was in May of uh, this year. Um, it's the uh, new anti epileptic day. Well, here's a, a, a really uh, good question. I, I'd like to <coughs> actually uh, ask Dr. Heck to uh, answer. Somebody asked, uh, how do you get into clinical trials? So Dr. Heck has led many clinical trials related to devices. I thought this was a really great question for uh, Dr. Heck. So most clinical trials that deal with epilepsy require patients at their baseline to have a certain number of seizures per month. So basically, um, you might be a candidate for a clinical trial if for instance, you, a, a trial required you to have three seizures per month. Um, that does, usually doesn't mean you have to have convulsive seizures, they can be partial seizures, but each clinical trial has their own criteria for getting into the trial. There are many places you can participate in clinical trials. Sometimes there are um, epilepsy doctors in the community who are, are working on these big trials with new medications. Um, and then, of course, there are places like USC, UCLA, the academic centers where epilepsy centers are doing sort of the cutting edge clinical trials. So some clinical trials are medication related. They're easier to find throughout the community. Um, epilepsy Foundation, the National Institute of Health, oftentimes list different clinical trials in epilepsy. Um, or um, contacting your Epilepsy Foundation um, and inquiring about clinical trials, they may have some information as well. Okay, um, there's a, a question that I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Holder. <laughs> as a parent with a child who has seizures, how can we be more helpful beside um, laying them down on their side and making sure they're not banging their heads when they have a seizure. Um, well, I mean, there's, there's not much we can do to make the seizure stop faster. 
other than just right. being with the child and trying to comfort them during the seizure. Right. Um, the good news is most seizures in children stop pretty quickly, usually in less than two to three minutes. So the most important thing is to keep the child safe and to be there to when they respond, for, recover from the seizure so that they see a familiar face and know that you're there to comfort them. Um, the goal is to try to prevent the seizures from occurring and that's what we're all working so hard to do. Definitely. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Santos, there's a question for you. How many milligrams of CD oil is therapeutic? Um, there is something in that package insert, but most of the studies are 10 or 20 gram, uh, milligram per kilo per day, divided twice a day. Okay. So we got back from the convention. Afternoon. The convention was this morning, the Epilepsy Awareness Convention. It was my first convention I've ever been to. It was pretty, pretty interesting. Pretty for me, it was a step I've never taken, you know, out of my comfort zone because I've always really been kind of kept it to myself, you know, never really wanted to make it known like that never really wanted people to feel like I needed help feel like I wanted to let people in and for me I'm kind of learning and trying to grow with that you know trying to let my family and trying to let my friends in you know because I do need help with this I do need guidance I do need help with my anxiety my depression my epilepsy everything that comes with it and this convention it helped a lot I mean they they showed me things that statistics everything they they had groups that were just willing to help and they just let me know that we weren't alone you know it just uh, they kind of gave me hope they kind of gave it that that you know it was kind of cool to, to know that that it would be okay, you know, or that it's at least that, that somebody cares, you know, and I, I, I really liked it. I mean, I was really nervous. I mean, for me being so nervous, I accepted it pretty well, I think, but it was definitely a little like me stepping out of my comfort zone, but I did pretty well, I think, and um. We asked a couple of questions. Really, I just tried to take in all the knowledge that I could and just everything that they were saying. My doctor was there as well. And um, they had the VNS stuff there and all that because I have the vagal nerve stimulator right here. They showed me all the upgrades and they talked about all the newer upgrades that are coming and all types of stuff. So it kind of really gave a lot of hope and just it was crazy meeting people that also have epilepsy and the kinds of stories that they go through and deal with of you know of having a license and then losing it because they had seizures while driving also or you know or having seizures in the bathtub like I have or you know crazy stuff you know just having them out in public or you know just anything and then also having the fear of one day you might not wake up and that was awesome kind of just talking with other people that go through the same experience that you do and I, to anybody who does have, have epilepsy I'd recommend go and try to find a group of someone with epilepsy and you know just get a feel for that because that kind of gave me a little calmness because that helped a lot Cause lately I've been fearing that, that that's my deepest fear. My deepest fear is is having that last that last seizure. Like, and that's one thing I need to explain to everyone is like seizures ain't a joke, man. Like, it's like imagine going dark and passing out dark, like pitch black. You don't know what happened like your life is taken, like it's gone, like you out. And 
you don't know, you don't remember anything from that moment on. And you don't know if you're going to wake up. You don't remember, and if you do wake up, you don't remember who's around you. You don't remember who the people are around you. You don't remember nothing. And then you don't even really know who you are. You, you're, you're panicking. So now you're waking up into this world that you're trying to remember everything. And it's, it's the scariest feeling ever. And then when it does start to come back, you're like, damn, like this shit feels like it's killed me. Like, and then one day you hear that it, it's killing more the people than cancer. Like, that's the craziest part. Like, no, nah, but yeah, this, this definitely needs to be taken serious. And I'm just glad I really went to this convention and I hope it could be an eye opener for everyone, but I know it was more of an eye opener for me and I definitely want to find a group that I can talk with and get to know and I really want to push the the epilepsy more because since I've had it and I've kept my mouth shut for too long, you know, and it's time for me to speak up. So right now I'm going to be taking my night meds. So I'll show you guys. This is what I usually take. I got my morning meds up here. My night meds right here. And I'll be taking them right now. Today is today. See, I got short memory. I see I'll be tripping. I'll be today is okay. Yeah. Tuesday. Yeah, these are all my pills that I'm gonna be taking right here. Oh, almost lost one. Yeah, so it's a lot of little pills right there. As you can see, they're all filled up. They're all, you know, they all got their things. I take probably about in a day, probably like, I'd say I need probably like 12 to 15. but it's definitely something that needs to be more brought up about. So with that being said, the convention was great. I really loved it and I'm so glad I went and I'm thankful for everyone that I met there. Thank you for the knowledge that I got and I am hoping that you guys would join me on this fight for epilepsy and everyone just, everyone with epilepsy, there's always hope that we're gonna get through this. Remember, we survivors. Look at that, I'm a survivor. I'm gonna get through it no matter what. So, we're gonna get it.